In this comic book is a love story, a boy and girl in love. They get married, and after an offensively lurid description, illustrated, of course, of the couple's wedding night, the book shows how the bride murders her husband by chopping his head off with an axe. This comic book describes a sexual aberration so shocking that I couldn't mention even the scientific term on television. I think there ought to be a law against them. Tonight I'm going to show you why. Confidential File. A report by Paul Coates. One of the nation's distinguished news reporters brings you a factual report on America today, its people and their lives. May I have your name, please? Uh, Estes Kefauver. And your age? Paul, I really might be inclined to plead the immunity of the Fifth Amendment on my age, but I guess it's all right. I'm 51 now. <laughs> And your occupation, sir? I'm a uh, politician, a member of the United States Senate. Senator Kefauver, uh, what have you learned in, so far in your investigation on the subject of comic books? Paul, we had an extensive hearing in New York some months back, and we've had other hearings in other parts of the country. I was amazed to find a number of comic books being published each month in the United States. We found about 100 million. Of these 100 million going out, uh, Approximately 80 million are all right, they're funny, entertaining, some of them are educational. But about 20 million were of the horror and, cri and crime type in which we are particularly interested. And this comic book uh, business is really big business. Well, what about the effect of these comic books on the children? Uh, all of our testimony from psychiatrists and uh, children themselves uh, show that it's uh, very upsetting it has a bad moral effect and that it is directly responsible for a substantial amount of juvenile delinquency and child crime. Are there presently comic books in publication that you feel are harmful to children? Yes, there are still some, although not as many as there used to be. The industry, you know, has appointed a czar. They have a code. Mr. Murphy is in charge of the code operation. They submit their comic books to him and he passes on them. They are not, uh, now not supposed to show crime and horror in their comics. Do you feel that uh, legislation to control this type of comic book, this harmful comic book, is indicated? Uh, yes, I think some legislation would be helpful. Uh, legislation regulating, uh, tightening up the mail statutes and regulation breaking up the tie-in sales. But I'm not in favor of a so-called censor legislation outlawing uh, comics altogether. Well, what do you think are the dangers to our constitutional rights in this type of legislation, Senator? I think the dangers are that if you uh, start uh, censoring comic books, it might lead on to censoring other things and uh, it might encroach upon our constitutional freedom of the press. And after all, Paul, uh, the only way that you can really stop this kind of thing is to arouse public opinion. If the people in a section decide they don't want uh, these horror and crime comic books sold, read by their children, if they will become adamant and vigorous about it, they will just not be sold in that section. That is the best guarantee. And Paul, that's uh, why I'm so happy that uh, you're doing this production confidential file, arousing public opinion in this whole field of juvenile delinquency, apathy, the lack of interest on the part of the people at the local community is the biggest uh, enemy that we have. And through uh, programs of this kind and committees that have been formed, other media of information, I think the people are beginning to know the facts and there are very wholesome evidences that they're doing something about it. Well, Senator, thank you very much for your cooperation. Good to be here with you, Paul, and I'll see you again. Good luck in your work. The sexy, crime-worshipping violence of certain comic books has come in for a lot of scathing criticism during the past couple of years. Resolutions have been introduced, experts have written books, governmental committees have held hearings. 
Even in the comic industry itself, steps have been taken to clean up some of the filth. The Comics Magazine Association of America, Incorporated, has been formed and a code written. Here's a copy of it. The code sounds fine and they've appointed a czar to enforce it. But the undesirable comic books haven't disappeared from the newsstands of this country. Why? I'll tell you exactly why. Because no action has been taken by the most powerful influence in America, the people, you. Many of the publishers are already out of business, but there's an immense backlog still in the warehouses and on the newsstands. Unless the individual communities find out where they are and get rid of them, these books will be around for years. There are about 60 million, that's 60 million, comic books published every month in the United States. But those figures are really quite misleading. In a minute, you'll see why. Ask 10 kids where they got the comic book they're reading. Maybe one or two will tell you they bought it. The rest traded for theirs. They buy one book and they read 10. It's wonderful economics, but unfortunately, it means that 10 times as many kids read books they never should even see. There are no economic or racial lines to the comic book threat. They reach every strata. Kids read them in the North and in the South. Stories like The Human Hyena. Stories like Time to Die. They read them in living rooms in Dubuque and alleys in Manhattan. They read them in tree houses. They read them tucked into their notebooks in classrooms. And at night they dream about them. One glance is enough to tell you that this boy just got out of school for the day. And why shouldn't he be happy? Until supper time, he can do anything he wants to do. He's free. And he knows exactly how he'll while away the hours. He'll spend a nice quiet afternoon with a comic book. I think it's important to note here that the comic book wasn't just an anti-boredom measure. He could have played baseball, but he chose the comic book instead. This is the hideout, the secret place where the gang, and I mean gang in a good sense, a group of pals, hangs out after school. It's part of growing up. It's the environment in which you learn to cooperate with your peers without interference from authority. Problems come up and you have to handle them yourselves. When I was a boy and played with the gang, we did a lot of things. We roasted potatoes, and went on expeditions, we tipped over garbage cans now and then, we wrote nasty remarks about the teacher on the sidewalk. But we never spent an afternoon sitting around like this reading. What a wonderful thing this would be if they were reading something worthwhile, something that would stimulate their desires to build and to grow. But they're not reading anything constructive. They're reading stories devoted to adultery, to sexual perversion, to horror, to the most despicable of crimes. corpse that came to dinner. One of the wonderfully appealing things about children is that they haven't yet come to the age where reality and unreality are divorced. The emotional impact of something they read in a comic book may be much the same as a real life situation they witness. This one's a poem. I think you should hear it. The draining rain sprays the pain tenderly. The whistling wind winds round the weeds tenderly. And I come to you with arms out wide and one thought inside of me. So I take your lips, I take your heart, 
tenderly. Maybe you can accept this fact, maybe not. But it is a fact, and I'll prove it to you later in the program. Horror and crime comics upset kids. I'm not talking about any subtle distortion of their emotional makeup. I think that occurs too. But there's a more noticeable, immediate effect. You can see the tension develop as the story gets more gruesome. And if it's a bad one, the kid is a mass of jangled nerves by the time he's through it. He wasn't going to hit you. He just wanted to know what it would feel like to almost knock someone's brains out. This story is about a man who dissolves his own brother in a bathtub full of acid. Ten cents at your neighborhood newsstand. But it looks like I was wrong. They're not going to read all afternoon after all. They've got a great idea for a game. Everybody can play. In this kind of a game, the more the merrier. Even the little guys are invited. My gang used to huddle too. We tried to figure out how we could build a raft to use on the river, or how to earn money for a wiener roast, or how to talk the grocer into buying uniforms for a baseball team. We usually figured it out too. Kids aren't always too realistic, but they're mighty ingenious, as you're about to see. They'll need a little special equipment for the game they're going to play. And they need one more man, preferably a small man. They promise him he'll be the star of the game and they're telling the truth. They're also telling the truth when they say it's the most exciting game he's ever played. And this is the beginning of a game of violence. They didn't think it up all by themselves, of course. They had an excellent manual, a regular do-it-yourself pamphlet, a crime and horror comic book. And they learned their lesson well. I'm not suggesting that comic books instilled violence in the minds of these boys. I've never heard any responsible person suggest that. What I am suggesting is that crime and horror comic books stimulate outbursts of destructive violence that might otherwise have been channeled into much less antisocial activity. And remember, these are not the faces of an isolated group of kids. These are not delinquents, not criminals. These are the faces of your sons. These boys are playing, and yet they're not playing. Games like this have ended in death many times. Usually, of course, there's no apparent damage. But I think there is damage, deep, serious damage. Quite a repertoire of torture techniques. Why not? They've spent literally hundreds of hours studying the texts. This, for instance, is an ancient Chinese method, as any confirmed comic book fan can tell you. Men are getting rich off the comic books that teach kids this kind of activity. I don't know how you like it, but it makes me kind of sick. Confidential File will be back in a moment. First, here's a message from our sponsor. Story, I try always to contact the most highly qualified experts on the subject, so let's talk to some experts on comic books. And your name, son? Bernie Kenner. And how old are you, Bernie? Fifteen. Fifteen. And you read comic books too, yes. don't you? Do they bother you in any way? At first they did. How'd they bother you? Well, it was bad dreams at night. Mm -hmm. I used to talk in my sleep. Used to talk in your sleep? Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the stories you've read in comic I read books. this one about this lady. She always liked diamonds, so she used to date these men and used to buy her diamonds, and then she killed them. The I, I didn't follow you. The men would buy her diamonds? Diamonds, and then she used to take them home and kill them and mm -hmm. bury them in the basement. This kept going on for about a year, and the basement's all full of graves. There's only room for one more grave. So she says to herself, I want the richest man in town to buy me a diamond, and then I could kill him. 
So she went into this jewelry store and met this man and they started dating each other. So the man bought a diamond and they went home. Then she put a knife on him but the man took it away and killed him and they went downstairs and the man buried her. And then he came upstairs and he said to himself, you see darling I'm not a collector of diamonds but of hands and he, he cut off her hands. And that made you pretty sick. Yes. <laughs> I can believe that. All right, Bernie, thanks a lot. You're welcome. May I have your name? Ronald Kirahara. Talk up a little bit, huh? Ronald Kirahara. And how old are you, Ronald? Twelve. What do you think of comic books, Ronald? They're all right, but uh, they scare me. They scare you? Yes. Why do they scare you? Tell me about how they scare you. Well, when I, go, uh, when I sometimes read them, I go to uh, at night when I... When at night when I sleep, I dream. Mm -hmm. And so once I dreamt uh, that this Martian from Mars came after me, and I woke up real fast. Mm -hmm. And this was after you'd read one of these horror comics, huh? And does your mother know that these comic books upset you when you read them? No. Doesn't realize that, huh? Tell me about some of the stories you've read in comic books, will you, Ronald? Well, I read this uh, Frankenstein. He was at this uh, man's old man's house, and uh, this, uh, he was a friend of this man. So one day, um, these two men came in and uh, they killed him. So Frankenstein, he killed them and then he buried the old man. And then later, anyone that touched the tree would be killed. The tree was the old man buried under the yes. tree? I see. And so uh, one night, this uh, young couple, uh, they were in love. So they uh, carved a heart on a tree. And uh, when he saw that, he killed them and hung them on a tree and the birds, they picked at them. The birds picked at them? Yes, until they died. Mm -hmm. All right, Ronald, thank you very much. You want to give me your name, son? David Freeman. And how old are you? Eleven. Tell me how comic books make you feel, Dave. Well, they don't make me feel too good. A couple of times you read a comic book, I threw up. Can you tell me a story that you read in a comic book? Yes, uh, I read a story about this baseball game, and this man, he was losing his team for the pennant, and he uh, uh, tried to uh, kill this guy, put some poison on his shoes, and when he went to first base, he uh, cut the guy's foot and poison got into his foot, and he died, and the team found out, so they had a night game, and then they got this guy, and they killed him, and then they used his head for the ball, and every time they threw the... Uh, ball, the uh, blood kept on uh, squirting out. And they used his feet for the bat, and they used his insides for different bases and uh, out one of the game. Do your folks know that you read these comic books? No, but my friends, uh, they gave it to me. You know, they let me read a couple. You know, you mean you're not allowed to have them in your home? No. And you get them from your pals? Yes. Where are you from, Dave? Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And your name? Frank Delavara. Talk up a little, Frankie, huh? Delavaro? Frank Delavara. Frank, and you read comic books too, don't you, Frank? No, oh, once in a while. Uh, could you tell me the story, one of the stories you've read in a comic book? Oh, yes, there's one. There's a... Uh, well, there was a scientist in a sto cold storage room of a national museum, mm -hmm. and one of the scientists found a... Uh, Sort of like this block of ice with a with a prehistoric man in it. Well, they uh, they they were arguing if they should defrost it or not because because they one said that it couldn't be living after all those millions of years of being in ice, and then the one that found it said that he didn't want to tamper with it because it might be dangerous. So they said, okay, we won't uh, defrost it. So then the cold storage room got on fire somewhere. I don't know how it didn't say in the book. And it just started to uh, burn, and the uh, and the black of ice melted. And uh, and then the scientists were standing at the door, and the uh, and the uh, and the prehistoric man looked at him, and they and they started to get scared because they thought it was gonna attack him. You know, so mm -hmm. the prehistoric man jumped out the window. So then the they went after him, the guards and the scientists. And uh, the scientist went into the, the one that found him went into a park and uh, and, uh, and he turned around and, uh, and the prehistoric man was going to hit him with his club. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you feel when you read stories like this? I, I get a kick out of them because they, uh, they, they seem so fun like. Yeah, thank you very much, Frankie. 
What's your name? Bruce. Bruce what? Kanowitz. Kanowitz? And how old are you, Bruce? Eight and a half. And do you read comic books? Yes. Do you read pretty well? Yeah. You look at the pictures mostly. I read mostly. You do? What kind of stories do you read in comic books? Sometimes horrors. Yeah. But I don't like them much. Why not? Because they're too scary. They scare you at night, too? Not much. Huh? In the daytime, I we always read them. Well, you read them in the daytime. Can you tell me about any stories you've read in these horror comics? Yes. All right. Well, this one about the vampire. Well, there was uh, three men and this, uh, and uh, this native. And this native had a charm that would scare away this vampire. So one day, one of these men started to roam around. He went into a cave. So then came the vampire and killed him. Mm-hmm. And then the men saw, came over and saw that he was dead. So then they went on. And then these two men that were left and the girl, the two men killed the native and took away his charm because that charm could scare away the vampire. Mm-hmm. So the, when the guy took off the charm, this other guy shot him. So this other guy and this lady was left. So then when this, uh, then they went on and uh, the man and the lady were in the cave and the man had a, uh, a thing, a stick, and the, if he would stick that, uh, uh, stick through her heart, the vampire's heart, when she's sleeping, then I'll die. So then they went through the cave where the vampire was, so then they went on. So then the lady got tired and hugged the man, but when the lady hugged him, he said she got him. Of course, uh, the vampire just jumped on him, and he was just about to reach for his charm, but mm. he couldn't, and he was dead. And Didn't have a chance there. to reach for it. And the lady ran away. She was safe. Do, do your mommy and daddy know that you read these comic books? No. Well, I don't think they'd like, like it if they knew it, would they? Yeah. Where, do you, where do you get them? Do you get them from your friends? No, no, I guess not. Uh-huh. Well, all right, Bruce, thanks very much. Yeah. I suppose by now you're wondering what kind of a guy would draw those things. It's a legitimate question. It deserves an answer. May I have your name, please? Ellis Erringer. And your age, Mr. Erringer? Thirty. Your occupation? Cartoonist. What do you know about crime and horror comics? Well, I've uh, drawn a few. How long ago was that? I would say about three years ago. That was about the time the uh, horror craze started. Yeah, and how did this craze get started? It first started as a science fiction kind of a weird thriller with certainly no harm in it. But then uh, the fly-by-nighters got into what they considered a very lucrative field with the ghouls and the mummies and, mm-hmm. and what have you. Tell us about your first job with yeah. in the cheap little romance books that you worked on. In the romance books, the emphasis, of course, was on sex and uh, clinches and uh, exaggeration. And, mm-hmm. and uh, the dialogue had double meanings, and it was pretty rough if kids had their hands on it. Uh, here, for example, you have this uh, female. Uh, when I had originally drawn it, it wasn't quite as exaggerated as as it appears mm-hmm. right there, uh, namely the upper torso yeah. area. Often, staff artists will make these changes without the the artist, the freelance artist, even knowing about I it. I see. Are you still drawing crime and horror comics? No, I'm not. Why not? Well, I feel about the same way you do. I, mm-hmm. It's the sort of thing that I wouldn't want my kids to have his hands on. There are good books. My kids constantly read comic books, but uh, I like to keep them away from the horror. Yeah. Well, then I would assume that you subscribe to the fight against crime and horror comic books the same as we do. I, I certainly do. Thank you an awful lot for your cooperation here tonight. Thanks, Mr. Ernst. welcome. I mentioned before that the final responsibility for the control of crime and horror comics rests with you. A few cities have already done something about them, not too many, but a few. Legislation against unfit comic books is possible. Legislation that won't interfere with the rights of a free press. Contact your city officials. Let them know how you feel about the crime and horror comics. And remember this. America is the richest country in the world, with the world's biggest producer of goods. But our most important commodity, the one commodity we can't put a price tag on, is our children. And now, a final word from our sponsor.
have just witnessed another authentic report by Paul Coates, distinguished columnist and news reporter. These factual reports are brought to you each week by this station. They reflect those of station or sponsor.